kicking off the list at number 10, Sins Past. This five part storyline revealed that Gwen Stacy and Norman Osborn had an affair. Yeah, you heard me. To two children named Gabriel and Sarah. This one upset comic book fans quite a bit. So in The Amazing Spider-Man number 509, Peter gets this letter, right? And the letter is supposedly from a dead Gwen Stacy. Yeah, she's dead and gets a letter. The dead letter. Lead letter. I can't think of a pun there. That's the first. So Peter does a little detective work and runs some DNA tests on the letter. And he comes to find out that Gwen Stacy had actually given birth to twins. Her DNA was on the letter. This is happening. Mary Jane finally ends up filling Peter in on this dark secret that Gwen Stacy had a secret affair with Norman Osborn seven months before she died. Huh. Mary Jane even had a conversation with Norman about it. And she said she doesn't want Norman to take care of the kids or else they're just gonna end up turning into another version of Harry Osborn. I mean, you got a point. Right off the bat though, Norman's exposure to the Green Goblin formula caused these kids to be born early and they came out fully grown. And we see that in the comic. Also, ouch. Number nine, Amazing Spider-Man 100. Hey, it's Spider-Man, but he has six arms. Well, that's what happens when you ingest a chemical that's meant to neutralize your powers. Okay, well, as we see in almost every comic book ever, it doesn't go as planned. He grows four extra arms, having six in total. Yeah, six in total, got it, I'm good. The only way to save this Spider-Man's dilemma is Michael Morbius's blood. So the six-armed Spider-Man, or also known as the Man-Spider, which is pretty fitting at this point. Man-Spider is gross too, like imagine waking up and there's this just Peter Parker with all those legs, like, hey, you thirsty? I'd be like, do you stop? <laughs> it kind of reminds me of a champ. I mean, it's always nice to see your favorite hero get an upgrade, but sometimes it's a bit too weird. I don't know. Like, imagine if you had six arms in the movies. Like, that's so much sweat. He'd be fighting bad guys and kick ass, but he would be so exhausted. That's six arms that he has to swing constantly. There'd be so much sweat. It would look like a Sprite commercial. People just dripping. I'm here for it. I kind of like it. I wish he stayed like that. He didn't, but I kind of wish he did. Number eight, Ultimate Spider-Man 66. So when you think of two superheroes swapping bodies, you think, oh, that must be entertaining. I mean, Fantastic Four, Rise of the Silver Surfer wasn't a great film by any means, but that concept was still pretty fun to play with. Well, with Spider-Man and Wolverine swapping bodies in Ultimate Spider-Man, things get weird. Very weird. So after Ultimate Spider-Man issue 66, Wolverine is now a total creep, more so than before. Now here's what happened. Mesmero switched their bodies up, so Peter was like, hey man, I really need you to go to school. Like, I'm slash you are 15, we have to go. This is an important thing. So while Wolverine is in Peter's body, he at one point ends up kissing Mary Jane, and he even tried to sleep with her. And cue the jail. Where can we, is there a jail we can put this guy in? Let's put him in jail right now. Apparently all those walks to school in the morning made him realize that she truly is awesome. I mean, we always knew that, but he might have not. MJ told him that she wants to wait until they're older for that kind of thing, you know, that kind of thing. So thankfully, nothing happened. But this was for sure an issue or two we could have gone without. I'm trying to get that thought out of my brain. Find somebody your own age. Number seven, Toxic Love. Spider-Man Reign was issued in 2006 and it was quite interesting. So the four part story begins with an old Peter Parker and many fans compared it to the Dark Knight Returns. Similar vibes for sure. Only difference is that in this story we have visions of a dead Mary Jane and it's very disgusting. Sad old Peter Parker, no thank you. Plus to make matters worse, so much worse, he actually caused her death in this issue. Yeah, how you ask? Well, his um, web shooter ended up giving Mary Jane cancer. And by web shooter, I mean his, how do I say this? This is so weird. Number six, Amazing Spider-Man 386. This one is neat. So right on the cover of this one, we see the text. The most cataclysmic events of Spider-Man's life begins in this issue. And I'd say that I agree with that. Peter's parents returned. Hooray. So in issue 365, we meet them again. Peter comes home and Aunt May's like, hey, hey, I'm just in the kitchen with some new guests. And Peter's like, whoa, guests? Huh, I love guests. I wonder who it is. Are those my parents? Yes, only they were evil androids. Fun fun, I guess. So his parents were actually robots and they were feeding back intel about Peter back to Chameleon. So they were just lying to Peter, obviously, and they explained that they didn't die because they were putting in motion this secret government plan, even saying they were in a Russian prison camp for 20 years. I mean, sure, we'll believe that. I guess, if we have to. Chameleon created these fake parents for Green Goblin, who already knew Spider-Man's secret identity. So, what's the point? We don't know. 
Number five, Spider-Man 3. Yeah, I'm going to the film category for this one because I gotta get this one off my chest. Spider-Man 2 is arguably one of the best superhero movies ever. Not even just Spider-Man movies, like as a superhero movie, this kicked ass in my ever so humble opinion. Then Spider-Man 3 came out in 2007. Everyone's like, yeah, here we go. Trilogies, they rock. And suddenly no one gave a shit about Spider-Man anymore. <clears throat> Including the people who apparently made the movie. I don't know. Venom was absolutely butchered. Sandman retconned the entire first movie's main driving force to make Peter Parker become Spider-Man, changing the whole Uncle Ben dying situation. Great. The movie itself just had a weird tone. Like I felt like I was watching three different Spider-Man movies at the same time. And all three of them had this different direction and they just weren't complete. And they just jammed it all into one movie. Like I love Sam Raimi, but Oh, the dancing scene, we didn't need that. Who, we didn't need that. I mean, thank you for the thousands of memes. You've definitely supplied us some comedy, but I'm really hoping this other Spider-Man 3 with Tom Holland doesn't go this route. They already have too much on their plate, I think, for this one movie. I mean, Sinister Six being rumored to be in the movie and then all these other Spider-Man actors returning. Don't get greedy, just let it, Go, let it go organically. We sat through Iron Man 3. We're gonna sit through five more Spider-Man movies if we have to. Take your time. Don't mess it up. Number four, Spectacular Spider-Man 12. Okay, so back in 1976, we got to see a redneck superhero. And I wish I was joking. Kind of, do I? I don't know. Spectacular Spider-Man issue 12 opens with Peter having a nice game of tennis with Flash Thompson. And then in comes trouble. Trouble in the shape of brother power and sister son. And one thing leads to another and they join hands and of course now they can shoot beams out of their chest, like Care Bear style. And then in comes Razorback, the superhero who speaks like Ruth Langmore with that southern twang. Sorry, I'm gonna offend so many people with this one. Here we go. That southern twang. And to make matters even more weird, he looks like a pig. Like that's the outfit that he went with. I hope I never see this guy in a Spider-Man movie. Or if I do, I'm playing him. I'm gonna be like, what you doing up there, sticky boy? Number three, Spectacular Spider-Man Volume 2. Issue 16, that is. This one I wish I could forget existed. Leave, leave my brain, go, just get out of here. So we've seen Peter Parker change with his powers. I mean, he doesn't need the glasses, he gets some abs, starts getting ripped, whatever, yada, yada, yada. But how about becoming an actual spider and laying eggs? So after a not so chill run in with the Spider Queen, she injects some pretty nasty goop into Peter Parker. And then the next thing you know, Peter has like two extra eyes. And if that wasn't enough for you to feel sick to your stomach, he ends up becoming an actual spider and gives birth to Peter Parker. Okay. Ew, first of all, Peter comes out looking the exact same. I mean, he's naked and shredded, awesome. So the point of this is useless, I guess. I mean, he's reborn with organic web shooting abilities, which I didn't like. Made me feel gross. Like in the first movie when you see him, it's like, what does that feel like coming out? Ah, oh, can't be pleasant. Probably like noodles, just noodles flying out of your veins. That's the grossest thing I've said on this channel. My favorite part has to be when he attends a Star Trek themed wedding, because those exist, and his disguise just happens to be perfect to mask what's going on in his life. Number two, Attack of the Clones. No, not that one. The Clone Saga is one of the worst parts of the Spider-Man universe. Spider-Man far too long, rather. The story itself was a chore to keep up with fans. Characters coming back to life and dying again, it almost felt like a waste of time. Well, it definitely felt like a waste of time. The whole time you didn't know who the real Spider-Man was, but the story was so jam-packed full of this nonsense that it honestly got lost in this rubbish story. We didn't know if Peter or Ben was the clone, and they just kept dragging this one idea on and on, and in the end, it doesn't even matter. Lincoln Park. And finally, for number one on our list, One More Day. This is a four issue story, but because of delays, it took five months to conclude. Love it, gotta love it. So of course that adds to the mix already with a not so well revived story. Okay, so the story begins in 2007 in the Amazing Spider-Man issue 544. And instead of the usual thugs or the enhanced scientist villain that Spider-Man usually faces, he makes a deal with the devil. The devil, of course, being Mephisto. So after Spider-Man revealed his identity in the Civil War storyline, people of course knew who he was and now they're after him knowing his true identity, right? People want this guy dead, a lot of them. So after a bullet strikes Aunt May instead of Peter, he of course feels like he is to blame. So first, he goes to Iron Man to give him being the one who basically convinced Peter to reveal his identity. So he webs him up and gets all bad cop. It's actually pretty wild. So he talks to MJ in the next issue and explains how that bullet was meant for him. And 
consuming him. Peter is feeling this guilt. Mephisto has entered the chat. Yeah, the devil shows up, offers a deal to Peter while Aunt May is currently dying. So MJ adds to this deal. She pitches, basically the world will forget about Spider-Man's identity. Aunt May will live, but MJ and Peter will have never gotten married. So they hug one final time and MJ explains that their love was always meant to be and that whatever Mephisto does is unstoppable. And then, poof, the deal is sealed. The next day, Peter's like, oh man, another uneventful night, just the way I like it. And then that fast, all of that backstory was just gone. And fans weren't having it. Number 10, hunting season. This is the beginning of a run, let's remember. The story comes to us from the beginning of Wolverine Volume 5 from 2013, starting off in issue number one. We start off in the middle of a massacre without really any explanation. Why are we here? What's happening? Why are there all these bones and skeletons in a mall? What's going on? Wolverine is being targeted by a villain who we later learn is named Robert Gregson. Wolverine is trying to protect his son Alex from him as Robert has an alien blaster that can obliterate living cells. Where did this man get this alien blaster? Who gave it to him? Thankfully, Wolverine's healing factor allows him to save the day, but all the dialogue straight out of the gate is just pretty strange and weird. Especially as we aren't really given any context before we jump into the situation. We're just thrown into it. Number 9. Vendetta's Echo Really one of the weirdest things about Wolverine is all the random team ups he's had. Why? Well, because he's just so popular of a character that everyone wants him to make an appearance in their comic to help sell those issues. Gotta sell those issues. He even made his way into the Blade comic. In issue 6 of the 2006 series, Wolverine popped up during the Superhuman Registration Act days when Blade was tasked with hunting him down. Now these two square off, but Blade ultimately doesn't end up bringing him into S.H.I.E.L.D. custody. Why? Because he remembers years ago the Wolverine actually helped him out. It's a pretty random story all in all especially as like there is no consequences or anything but it's fun to see Blade and Wolverine face off and it's kind of cool to learn they had history but also what the heck that's so random Wolverine just had history with everyone because he's Wolverine I guess before we move on to number eight, I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. We really appreciate you being here. If you want to help us out even more, you can do so by giving this video a thumbs up and hitting that subscribe. We really appreciate it when you do. Number eight, Origin. I actually enjoyed the Wolverine origin story, especially the artwork. I didn't mind a little less mystery when it came to Wolverine in terms of learning his past with Rose and Dog and his original name of James Howlett, but what I did find strange in that story was when they decided to really drive in all the details that we felt were needed in an origin story. Like Logan's code name, Wolverine. Apparently that comes from his mining days according to his origin series. Yep. He works so hard in the mines they call him a Wolverine. What the heck does that mean? Maybe because he's like ruthless like a Wolverine? As far as I know, Wolverines aren't well known for digging or mining skills or their hard work. They're just known for killing things that are larger than them. It would be more appropriate to call him a mole who are known for their prowess and hard work as diggers. Could you imagine if we had like Mole Man? That was We do have a Mole Man. He's a villain, so already taken, I guess. We can't call Wolverine Mole Man. <laughs> The other weird thing about this whole comment is the fact that apparently, you know, it's a little Wolverine's code name, but Wolverine doesn't even hear this remark. He's like on a hill while these guys are talking completely far away from him, so he doesn't even hear what they say. And how would he even remember this? Doesn't his memory wipe out all of these traumatic things so he doesn't even know his past? This doesn't make any sense. So I like that we learn a lot about where he came from, but putting the origins of his code name in there just felt a bit much. Unless, like I said, Wolverines do happen to have some mining skills that I'm unaware of. If so, then I guess okay. Let me know in the comments if there's Wolverines that you know that have mining skills. <laughs> Number seven, Dreams of Gore. What an aptly named story. This one is as strange as it is important. In this story, we get tons of important flashbacks to a time when Wolverine got some of his memories back via unexpected flashbacks. Many of them involved his traumatic past and, as the name implies, a lot of gore. As he flashed back to these memories and became lost in them, he almost hurt the ones he loved, like Jubilee, and so he began to dig. Dig into those memories. Dig like a mole. <laughs> dig like a wolverine. What we would end up finding was a villain who had a hook for a hand and the epic but very 90s robo villain Shiva. Yes. More Shiva, please. Number six, Tokyo Story. Okay, so this one was more of a full on X Men story, but I think as long as Wolverine is primarily featured alongside his fellow X Men, we can consider it a Wolverine story too. Huh? Yeah? You with me? 
One of the weird parts about this issue is the random dragon they are faced with fighting who is implied to be a paramour of Lockheed's, though is now apparently much more massive than before. I don't know. But the other strange part is that when Wolverine moves through the rubble looking for survivors after the dragon's attack on Tokyo, he smells blood and follows the scent to find a woman who shielded the blow of a collapsing building from her daughter. Sacrificing her life for her daughters, the nameless dying woman wonders who will look after her daughter when she is gone. Wolverine steps up without any hesitation or questions. Kind of a weird thing when you know he's an X-Men with a lot of other responsibilities to be mindful of. He could have promised her to deliver the young girl to relatives or you know, simply reassured the woman that her daughter would be looked after, but now he says he'll raise her as his own. Which basically means Yukio will actually end up looking after her most of the time, as Wolverine is, you know, busy being an X-Man most of the time, so I don't know really why he made that promise. Number 5. The Black Blade The Black Blade is the conclusion to a story where Wolverine as Patch finds himself possessed by the influence of Muramasa's Black Blade. Having freed Jessica Drew from its influence, he himself is now possessed by a part of Muramasa's soul. It turns him into a demon-like character and the unlikely team up of Lindsay McCabe and Silver Samurai must work together to free Wolverine from its influence, each for their own reasons. Except that neither of them knows that Wolverine is Wolverine, because they're both fooled by his clever disguise, this patch. Even when Lindsay shoots him directly in the head and Patch recovers, saying, you know, oh, I got a thick skull, she's still none the wiser. She's like, sure, Patch, you have a thick skull. This makes total sense. I just shot you in the head. How are you getting up? What's happening? I love this weird issue the most, though, because of the crazy moment where we think Lindsay may have tortured or killed a woman, but being an actress reveals it was all a good show and clever make pretend. She even did well enough to use stage blood on her blade, which was what had me convinced, but she conveniently apparently got that from O'Donnell's makeup stores that his dancers use. Okay then. Number 4. Fatal Attractions In the story Fatal Attractions, Wolverine lost all his adamantium and his nose to boot. This all happened when Magneto took things too far and used his powers to pull all the adamantium out of Wolverine's body. That's how I would do that if I had magnet powers. This would result in Wolverine becoming feral, and eventually he would also develop some problems with his healing factor. This would also be a big moment for Wolverine where he would realize more clearly what his claws were really all about, and the fact that they were made of bone, not adamantium, as had been implied much earlier in the original Wolverine series. Wolverine would eventually get his nose and sanity back when his friends spent time helping him recover his humanity, but before then, it would be an interesting artistic ride where we'd see Wolverine leave the X-Men and go out on his own for a time. Number three, see Venice and die. I just also love the title of this story. What is the title of the story, you know what I mean? This whole story featuring LCD and Albert was just a wacky one. It's just one wacky ride. These two were basically robo assassins who were attempting to get rid of Wolverine. LCD was an android that looked and sounded like a whittle girl with a whittle wisp. She was super cute, but super deadly, and designed to also be a bomb that could be used to basically blow Logan away. In this story, we see her upgrade her companion Albert, who appears as a cyborg Terminator version of Wolverine before Albert uses his new smarts and modem to upgrade Elsie herself. This is what actually made Elsie decide not to follow through with her mission eventually and switch sides. Both androids receiving a heightened intelligence made them value life more and want to hold on to it a little longer. Number 2. Midgard's Final Doom This is an alternate Wolverine story which takes place in a Thor comic, but stick with me here. In this alternate reality, Logan becomes the Phoenix. A few times while palling around with Thor, Logan both attacks King Thor and at other times tries intensely to help him. In Midgard's Final Doom, Doom, Phoenix Logan sacrifices himself so the King Thor can finally take out Doom. It's not only strange that there is an alternate future where Wolverine becomes Phoenix, although oddly enough, it actually isn't the only reality or time that this has happened in comics, but it's also strange that Logan sacrifices himself only to come back again later, because you know, I guess that Phoenix can never die and all that. I can't deny that I love how pretty and weird this one is though, it's pretty great. Number 1. Soul Survivor Remember that time we learned that Wolverine kept having to fight the angel of death every time he died in order to come back? Yeah, that was a whole thing that happened. In volume 3 of Wolverine and issue 61, we get a story called Soul Survivor, where we see Logan bargaining to get the part of his soul back that was being held hostage. It's one of those weird stories that is the typical comic book story moment of, oh, that's what you thought happened, but what really happened was this and that. And 
and so and on. Those good old major misdirects that retcon major stories and plot points away. Gotta love them. This story is so bizarre, I doubt many of us remember that it exists because it's just so weird. But hey, it does. Wolverine explains that when he dies, he is forced to fight the Angel of Death, sometimes known as Azrael, sometimes known as Lazir. Winning puts his soul back in his body, which can then heal. Losing means losing his soul for good. Kicking off the list at number 10, Sad Space Worms. World's Finest Comics issue 289. We see Batman and Superman as they decide to catch up on some bro time. You know, take a break from beating dudes up all day, you know, just talk it out. I mean, the dialogue itself is really great stuff. It highlights the mental health struggles superheroes go through, not being able to save everybody. It's meaningful, it's powerful dialogue. It's just Superman and Batman talking alone in the Fortress of Solitude. But what takes this issue to new heights, well, rather, to new lows, is when Superman and Batman are interrupted by a meteorite crashing, and out of the meteorite emerges the crew. The crew being depressed space worms. Yep. They're attracted to sadness. That's actually how they found the two in the first place, because their super depression was just glowing. So these aliens need emotion to die. I mean, why didn't you guys just say so? I got the Titanic, I got Notebook on DVD, let's go. You guys will be gone in seconds, no problem. And before we move on guys, make sure if you haven't already, just toss us a quick thumbs up because it goes a long way here at our Fortress of Solitude. Thank you so much. Thanks. And number nine, we have Cat Fur Woman. Selena Kyle looked a bit different from the start, to say the least. We've seen numerous actors play the iconic Jewel Thief, with Zoe Kravitz playing her in the upcoming Robert Pattinson Batman. It's only fair to look back at her not so neat outfits. Well, in the first issue she appeared in, that being Batman 1 back in the 1940s, she was actually referred to as the Cat, rightfully so. Now, at this time, her outfit looked a touch different. In Batman 3, she came out in this red cape, yellow dress, and fur mask. It looked weird. To think of the character as we know her now, and then to see her in this outfit, it kind of reminds me of in Harry Potter, when Snape looks like Neville's grandmother. It wasn't until 1946 until her mask was changed to a more fitting look. Still not quite what we're used to, but definitely a step in the right direction. And then of course in the 50s she was deemed more of a sidekick to Batman rather than a villain, sporting a much cooler, less hairier look. And number 8, The Unstoppable Riddler. Usually when Batman punches you in the face, it kind of hurts. But if we look back at Edward Nigma in the Silver Age of Comics, specifically in Batman 171, the Riddler is setting booby traps left, right, and center, but when it comes down to the Batman making contact with the skin, he laughs. Is this a Joker or Riddler? What's going on here? Well, it turns out if you get some local anesthetic, punches to the face don't feel as bad. You don't say. Even on the cover of this issue, Batman and Robin are both surprised. What's keeping the Riddler up? He takes our hardest knockout blows and bounces right back. But how? And number seven, Batman the Witch. Released in 1969, issue 186 of the world's finest, we find Batman in quite the pickle. So Superman and Batman at this point have traveled back in time to solve a mystery. Classic good old time travel fun. Wonder where the comics will take us today. So they go back in time and during their mission, they rescue a lady named Sylvia Ward. Now Sylvia was actually accused of witchcraft. Yeah, they went way back. So Superman and Batman save her, and then she thanks Batman by kissing him. Oh, super emotional, very nice. Right on the lips. Intimate, cool. And then Superman goes in to introduce himself, and Batman interrupts and takes her to the local bar. Okay. So Superman decides to use this era in his favor. So he dresses up as Batman, starts doing all this wacky stuff, doing all this witchcraft stuff, so much so that the town deems Batman a witch. He's about to be burned at the stake, and then a thunderstorm rolls in, everybody leaves except for, you know, Ben Franklin, who's just hanging out, doing tests and stuff. He's just there. That's fine. You know, just playing with kites, checking out lightning, doing his Ben Franklin stuff. He actually tries to free Batman with one of his experiments, but Superman doesn't let that happen. He stops the electrical current from reaching him with his Superman hands. Even Ben Franklin's like, all right, I'm ahead of So when Batman asks Superman why he's doing this, Superman says, Figure it out yourself. Damn. So next time your friends start flirting with your crush, just you know, tell everybody in town that they're a witch. They'll handle them. Works every time. And number six, the rainbow costume. Sometimes it's tough picking an outfit for the night. Maybe you wore something similar right before. The whole thing is just stressful sometimes. And yes, that includes superheroes. In 1937, issue 241 of Detective Comics, we find Batman on the cover with quite the dilemma. He changes up the colors of his costume a lot in here, but why? Well, this has to do with the Comics Code Authority. So in order to appeal to the public eye that comics weren't just dark and gritty, you know? So this issue about Robin hurting his arm 
arm also happen to have Batman sporting some fun new colorful suits. Eventually just putting them all together and rocking the infamous rainbow suit, which is sick. He's like, what do you think about red? No? What do you think about green? Huh? Is today green? I don't know. It's pretty neat to see on the page, but unfortunately, I don't think we're gonna get any crazy colorful suits on the big screen anytime soon. And number five. Whale problems. So imagine you're Bruce Wayne, right? You're on a massive yacht, blasting some Dixie chicks. You're living it up, you're having a great time. Maybe you're showing off your fancy $6 million necklace. And then out of nowhere, a whale woman just blasts in and grabs it from you. We find this scenario in Batman 579. Bruce Wayne is, well, of course, shocked. He's like, uh, excuse me, Miss Whale, can you return this gem to me? That would be great, awesome, thanks to plenty. Now, of course, the whale doesn't cooperate, so Bruce heads to Gotham Aquarium to ask some questions. He meets Grace, a woman bound to a wheelchair who works at the aquarium. She gives the whole rundown on the orcas, how they fight other whales three times the size of themselves, and how she's working on a research project with orcas but the funding ain't going so well. So of course, you probably just figured out what's happening. She spends her time robbing from the rich and instead of keeping the wealth for herself, she just donates it to charities. What a sweetheart. Not a bad gig at all. She ends up becoming an orca forever. God, that would suck. But don't worry, don't worry, it doesn't last too long. Because in Detective Comics 819, she's killed by the great white shark. And number four, the Bat Baby. Issue 147 of Batman has one of the funniest pages on a comic book title page. So we have Robin, just regular old Robin, and a baby sporting the mask and the cowl. And the businessman on the cover says, look out, it's, it's Batman and Robin. Like he even stutters too, he's like, it's, a, uh, it's Batman, I think. That's definitely Robin, but is it Bat the baby, the Batman baby? And the weirdest part, he still has all the abilities of a full grown Batman. So it turns out Nails Finney brought them into a trap, and now Batman has shrunk down to the size of a child. So the headlines were amazing in the news that week. Gangland turns Batman into baby. And the photo is just Batman just like, <laughs> all moody, like at least smile or like put a thumbs up, throw a batarang, a little baby batarang. Robin at one point even has to carry him to the Batmobile. So what does Batman do? He embraces it, of course. He's like, fine, I'll dress like a baby. I'll become Bat Baby, I'll kick your ass. He does well though, or sorry, he does okay, rather, yeah. One of the headlines that you see next reads, Bat Baby does okay for a kid. Yeah, he's okay, he just rode a balloon up into the air and then fought three crooks as a baby, but you know, he did okay guys, it was okay. Don't, don't get that too high, he's fine. Yeah, he had to ride a balloon up because his legs were too small. I don't think we'll ever get this comic on the big screen, but you know what, I'll do it. If I get money, I'll do it myself. I'll hire my cousin, he's like four, let's do it. And number three, Zebra Man. We talked a bit about costume changes earlier, but that's not the end of it. Whenever a popular character changes their outfits, fans aren't usually fond of the change. It's not bad, it's just different, you know? So in Detective Comics 275, we meet the villain Zebra Man, who obtained his powers by discovering the lines of force. And no, I don't mean the same lines of force as Snowflame. I mean, these lines of force, yeah. So Batman becomes this after Robin accidentally shot this ray at him. Now, nobody can go near him or else the new force field zebra power will blast them back. He actually gets pretty sad about it too. Now, of course, things go back to normal, but the whole Batman zebra power idea, it's a little too weird for some and I don't blame them. And number two, Batmite. Of course, I have to include the 1937 Detective Comics issue 267 because we meet Batmite. Right from the start, the opening line of this dude is just ridiculous. He's like, hey, I'm not an elf. I come from another dimension to help you fight. Won't that be fun, huh? This wasn't really loved by the readers, I mean, of course. So in 1985, after Crisis on Infinite Earths, there wasn't really a rush to bring Batmite back. And lastly on our list, we have Bear vs. Bat. Yeah, you heard me. This was issue 285 of Batman, and I mean, just look at the front page illustration. How do you not want to see how this ends? Well, this is quite the holly jolly issue, as it takes place, of course, during the annual Gotham tree lighting ceremony. And after Batman hears on the police radio that the tree is in flames, he rushes over to investigate, and then this is where he discovers a bear is actually living in this tree. Nice. Now, of course, it's a Batman villain version of a bear. It's not Winnie the Pooh, you know, it's kind of scary. So now animal control comes in and safely removes said bear so that everyone can just enjoy the night and be happy and move on. No, that didn't happen at all. Batman actually comes in and decides, you know what, I'm just gonna kick this thing in the neck a few times, see what happens. I mean, I love animals personally, but if an evil bear threw hands with Bruce Wayne, I'm sorry, I gotta take my phone out, we're filming. I'll do it 
this way, not even this way. I'll give it some respect, you know? The sideways filming. Number 10, Swarm. If you have a fear of bees, or more specifically, mutated killer bees, then you might find the story of Fritz von Mayer to be terrifying. Mayer became a sometimes Spider Man villain after his transformation into basically a horde of killer bees. He was a scientist in the employ of the German Axis forces during World War II. Not much is known of his backstory previous to that, but with unlimited funding, he set out to study poisons, toxins, and bees. Finding an apparently mutated hive of bees, he attempted to awaken their killer instincts and seize control of them. But his plan backfired and they ended up gaining back their killer instincts and using them to swarm and kill Mayer. Mayer's consciousness however became absorbed into the bees as his physical form died. And as such, he is now a man who is made up entirely of bees. If that isn't something out of a nightmare, I really don't know what is. Number 9. Swamp Thing Alec Holland is believed by Swamp Thing himself to be the man that the creature once was. Alec Holland and his wife were living out in the swamp and were both scientists who had developed a bio-restorative formula that would solve world hunger. However, goons were to sabotage and destroy the discovery during this original origin story. The goons put explosives in the lab and Alec woke up following the explosion covered in the bio restorative formula. He ran out into the swamp but found himself merged with it becoming an avatar of the green. Merging with that swamp and becoming the monstrous creature known as Swamp Thing. Originally in the comics, Swamp Thing, believing it had once been Alec, was always trying to find a way to return to a more human state, longing to be mortal once more. Number 8. John Constantine We recently got an interesting look into John Constantine's origins in the new DC Black Label limited series Rise and Fall. Hellblazer Rise and Fall. That's the that's the whole long title. This is a story divided up and told over the course of three books. In the first book, we are told of Constantine's backstory and everything that has shaped him into the lovable troublemaker of an occult detective that he has become today. His life started in the dark from the moment he was born. His mother passed away bringing him into the world, which set the stage for what his life would then be like. His father turned to drink and treated young John harshly, never once sympathizing with his son, which only motivated John to become more of a young vagabond, staying out and running around the streets of London late at night. We also learn of the tragic loss of one of his childhood friends in the book. Truly, it's a must read for Constantine fans, or just for fans of good comics. Number 7. Batman The death of Batman's parents and the trauma he suffered from witnessing that as a young boy would forever change Bruce. It would turn him into the vigilante he is today and inspire him to set out on a mission to become the Dark Knight, dedicating his life to an intense training regimen and traveling the world to learn from a variety of masters on a variety of subjects, from detective work to martial arts to magic. To this day, it's still the death of Bruce Wayne's parents that remains one of the most tragic events in his life, still haunting him to the point that he's even seen hallucinating about his parents' death while tripping on Joker venom during the current events of Joker War. Always tends to be the thing he comes back to, that and currently the loss of Alfred. Number 6. Sentry Robert Reynolds was a drug addict who snuck into a lab and discovered the experimental golden Sentry Serum. Though the backstory he'd be given in the comics within the Marvel Universe later on would be much less dark. Consuming the serum granted, Reynolds gained the power of a million exploding suns, making him one of the most powerful superheroes ever known. Although the Sentry was a hero who was known for his Superman-like extreme level of goodness, he had a dark secret. One that was unknown even to him for a very long time. Bob Reynolds suffered from a split personality disorder, in part brought on by the villain Mastermind's manipulations, which meant that he was not only capable of immense good, but immense evil as well, as his personality split into that of the superheroic Sentry and the powerful supervillain known as the Void. When it was revealed that Bob himself was also the greatest villain on the planet, he recruited the help of his superhero friends such as Doctor Strange and Mr. Fantastic to help everyone, including Bob, forget about the Sentry, so that the Void would also never return, making Bob, for a time, the greatest hero that the world forgot. Number 5. Rorschach Walter Kovacs was raised by a mother who mistreated him, basically resenting his very existence. This mistreatment inspired Walter to stand up to those who would hurt others. These beliefs led to Walter himself to brutally confront his own schoolyard bullies, even going so far as to blind one of them as a child. Walter became a sociopath because of how he was treated when he was younger, believing in a strict moral code and using that as his own vigilante compass to decide who should be punished and how severely. His mother was a prostitute and when he learned of her death at the hands of her pimp, who force fed her Drano to kill her, he only responded with one word, good. Ooh. 
dark. Number 4 Jessica Jones In the Netflix Jessica Jones series, we learn that Jessica Jones became a detective and hero in essence because of the fact that she was assaulted and mind controlled by Purple Man, who made her to do all sorts of things that she didn't want to do. In the Alias series, Jessica Jones attempts to confront her trauma, wrestling with just how much control Kilgrave actually had over her, and if it's possible that part of her motivation for all of the things he had her do could have actually come somehow from within herself. This is a common thing with victims of this type of assault, wondering about how much responsibility or control you actually had in that situation, and in a sense blaming yourself for what happened to you. But beyond this, Jessica Jones's original origins, how she got her powers, actually involved a massive vehicular collision, where her entire family was killed except for her. And it's implied that she only survived because she was exposed to radioactive materials, whose containers were damaged in the accident, leaking out and interacting with Jessica. Jessica's original last name had been Campbell, and she didn't get her name Jones until she was later adopted by Alyssa Jones and her husband after Jessica's family's death. Ugh. Actually, Jessica seems to be a bit of a cursed name in the Marvel universe. There's a lot of Jessicas with dark origins. Number three, Magneto. Well known for a long time in the comics by his alias Eric Magnus Lencher, Magneto's original name and origins revealed that he grew up as a young Jewish boy during World War II named Max Eisenhart. His family left Germany when things started to get bad, retreating to Warsaw where they lived in the Warsaw Ghetto. Eventually, Max was taken to the extermination camp at Auschwitz after he and his family attempted to leave the Warsaw Ghetto. Following his time at Auschwitz, Max shed his original name and adopted another so that he might better fit in with his wife Magda's Romani people. When it comes to Magneto's backstory, he is no stranger to discrimination, and it is his suffering and the suffering of others that he has witnessed that has inspired him to become the villain and the sometimes hero that we know today. Number 2 Red Hood When it comes to Jason Todd's transformation from Robin to Red Hood, there was a ton of dark events that came into play here, which caused Jason Todd to go from hero to villain, and then of course to anti-hero. Todd was seemingly one of the permanent deaths in comics after he was beaten to near death by the Joker, following being sold out by his own birth mother, who he then even still fought to free before being killed in an explosion. We thought we'd never see him return, but he was later brought back using the Lazarus Pit, and then was trained by Dukra of the all cast and join the League of Assassins for a time. When he finally returned to Gotham, it was originally as the villain Red Hood, seeking brutal justice, and later on, as Joker would say in Three Jokers, Book One, becoming one of his own villainous creations. Ooh, so dark. When you realize you've become a thing you didn't want to be and someone evil made you that. Eee. Number one, Wolverine. Wolverine has more trauma in his life than all the X-Men put together. Actually, he's probably got more trauma in one pinky than all of the X-Men. The only thing that protects Wolverine from the darkness of his own a multi chapter tragic origins is the fact that his brain actually also uses his healing factor to basically rid him of undesirable or painful memories. Young James Hallett's powers first manifested when his birth father killed his foster father, the husband of his mother. In a rage, James used his bone claws to kill his birth father, Thomas Logan, and his mother, still recovering from the loss of her firstborn son, severely traumatized, then took her own life. There are a lot of things that came after that when it comes to Wolverine's story and his past, pretty much all of them being wrapped up in some kind of traumatic experience. Number 10, Doctor Strange. Doctor Stephen Strange was an accomplished and world-renowned surgeon until a tragic car accident. While he survived the crash, the nerves in his hands were severely damaged, making it impossible for him to recover well enough to return to his work as a neurosurgeon. Strange was egotistical to the point that he refused to do any other work in the medical community, attempting to use all of his funds to try and find a cure for his hands, and eventually sinking into a deep depression and alcohol addiction. Previous to his accident, it was his parents' death and the fact that he found great success early on that caused him to become materialistic in his pursuits, caring less and less for his patients and more and more about the acclaim and the money that he was making. Eventually, he heard of the mystical power of the Ancient One and used his last bit of money to set out to see if they might possess healing abilities strong enough to heal him. From there, he would become a reluctant, stubborn, and eventually extremely loyal and determined student and would go on to become the new Sorcerer Supreme and magical hero known as Doctor Strange. Number 9, Iron Man. Tony Stark has led quite the privileged life, basically being born with a silver spoon in his mouth. So you might think he's got it made when it comes to superhero origins, but let's not forget what it took to get him to build and operate his Iron Man suit, and what inspired him to become a hero. Tony Stark was giving a demonstration of his technology to the military when there was an explosion. Stark was injured and taken prisoner by a terrorist who wanted to use his brilliant mind to have him create weapons for them. Shrapnel lodged into Tony Stark's chest, moved ever 
closer to his heart. And it was the help of another brilliant prisoner, Nobel Prize winner, and physicist Ho Yinsen, whom Stark admired, that allowed Tony to survive and inspired him to build the Iron Man Mark I armor, which allowed him to escape, but at the cost of Yinsen's life, and put him on the path to becoming a hero. Number eight, Rocket Raccoon. Rocket Raccoon in the Marvel Cinematic Universe alludes to his character's dark origins when he gets into an argument with the other Guardians of the Galaxy, insisting they consider him to be a joke, and revealing that there is a lifetime of pain in his past which gives him the form and personality that he has today, as a being who was heavily experimented on, being torn apart and put back together more times than he can count. Previous to this origins though in the comics, Rocket was simply one of a group of animals given heightened intelligence and awareness by robotic beings, who sought to escape their duties of looking after mental patients in their care. Rocket was one of the animals who stepped in to take on these duties. Later on, however, even in the comics, while out exploring space, he would be abducted and taken to a place known as Lab World, where he was then studied and experimented on. Number 7. Two-Face Harvey Dent went from being on the side of the law and one of the biggest real life everyday fighters for justice in Gotham to becoming one of the city's most iconic villains. It all started when he was disfigured. During a trial, crime boss Sal Maroney threw acid in Dent's face, scarring him for life and driving him insane. Dent lost his faith in justice as a result of this incident and instead left it up to fate to decide whether he would behave heroically or criminally, often known for flipping a coin to decide his victim's fate. Number 6. Spider-Man Spider-Man's whole brooding and moody sensibility and his battle with depression, which would only grow over time, all stems back to his origins. The death and loss of Uncle Ben is what inspired Spider-Man to become a hero and also gives him a lifetime of weighty regrets. Uncle Ben's death could have been avoided in Spider-Man's mind if only he'd cared enough to use his powers to stop a thief in his path, who would shortly after end Ben's life. To Peter Parker, he may as well have pulled the trigger himself. This tragic and dark story would inspire the hero to use his powers more responsibly, but would also haunt him for the rest of his life. Number 5. Dr. Manhattan John Osterman's origin story as Dr. Manhattan is truly horrific. John found himself trapped inside a test chamber when he went to retrieve his watch, as it underwent a scheduled experiment. The experiment caused John to be taken apart at an atomic level, removing his intrinsic field, which is a term used in Watchmen to describe what holds atoms together, the force that does that. It's not actually a true scientific term, fun fact. As such, he was granted powers over the intrinsic fields of all things, using his powers to build himself a body three months later and physically manifesting in the cafeteria of his workplace. John's life would be forever changed and in becoming a god, he would not only look different, but would also become less human as the years went on, experiencing a detached feeling from life on earth. Number 4. Batman Bruce Wayne was just a young boy when he lost his parents. They were both killed point blank in front of him one night after the family had left the movie theater where they just watched Zorro and attempted to take a shortcut down an alley. A thief named Joe Chill killed them during a robbery, leaving Bruce alone in the world, save for the family butler, Alfred, who had become like a father to him. It was this tragic start to his life that caused young Bruce to grow up fast and a run in with a bat that inspired him to become the Dark Knight of Gotham known as Batman. It's also been argued countless times over that this traumatic event made young Bruce unstable, which is perhaps why he has turned to a life of vigilantism, unable to heal the mental wounds his parents' tragic deaths caused. Number 3. Gamora Gamora is the last surviving member of her race known as the Zen Huberis. They were a peaceful people who were all killed by a religious order when they resisted their attempt at dominance in the galaxy. Thanos managed to save Gamora and raise her as his daughter, turning her into his own weapon, modifying her with tech to grant her superhuman abilities. He planned on using her to defeat the villain known as Magus, who was also Thanos' enemy. While Thanos seemed to occasionally show Gamora fatherly affection, there would come a time when she would turn on him acknowledging him as someone who had used her for his own means and denouncing her allegiance to him, seeing him for what he was, a mad tyrant and a villain who was selfish and cold-hearted, 
seeking only to bring death to whatever planet, galaxy, or universe he was in. Number two, Raven. If we go back to the original New Earth continuity, Raven's origins are pretty freaking dark. Her mother was part of a cult, and when she tried to escape and leave, the members prevented her from doing so by summoning a powerful demon named Trigon. This demon then forcefully mated with her. From this, Raven was conceived. She was born Angela Roth and raised to control her emotions, to help prevent her from losing control of her demonic powers and to basically prevent her from giving in to the dark side. She was sort of like a Jedi, but with a demonic heritage. When she learned of Trigon's evil plans, she attempted to stop him and sought help from the Justice League, who actually refused to help her because of her demonic heritage, prompting Raven to work harder to become a hero and putting her on a path to become one of the Teen Titans. Number one, Spawn. Spawn was originally Albert Al Simmons, an assassin who was murdered by his friend while on a mission. He then is condemned to a life in hell, but makes a bargain to return to the land of the living so that he can see his wife one last time. However, he must agree to become a hell spawn in order to do so. The unfortunate side effect of which, that he doesn't learn until later, is that he will forget his memory somewhat. So he returns to life, but only as a faint recollection of his past. And what's more, his body is still kinda undead, making him appear as a horrific monster. So even if he had remembered his wife's name straight away, he would not be able to reveal himself to her. When he finally does remember his wife, he discovers she is remarried to one of his friends, and they now have a daughter. He also realizes that five years have passed since his death. Not what he had originally expected when he made that bargain. Spawn, lost in the world, is now forced to search for a new purpose while also conserving his powers, as once they're fully used up, he will return to hell. Number 10, Songs of the Orphan Child. This is a more weird, twisty moment that is part of a longer, more confusing story, and this moment makes it pretty weird and also adds to the confusion. This moment comes to us from X Man X 23's solo series, one of, anyways. In her 2010 series, we see her take on Miss Sinister, who is really Claudia. Ranko, a woman who was implanted with a genetic virus that basically transformed her into Mr. Sinister following his death. However, Mr. Sinister sought to use Miss Sinister's body to return fully, even shape-shifting or exploding, into his true form as Miss Sinister sought to gain more control over this new form herself, in essence becoming an independent though still villainous entity. This allowed us to get a moment at the end of issue 5 where we see Mr. Sinister bloodily break through Miss Sinister popping out from beneath her form, like a hideous magic trick. Blech. Mr. Sinister had returned. However, in the next comic, he instantly disappears, turning back into Miss Sinister once more. So this whole shocking cliffhanger is instantly erased in terms of its importance for his full return. Gotta sell those comics, I guess. Number nine, the Pizza Hut Collector's Edition. There's a few locations that would be perfect for a fight. I mean, New York City gets a lot of attention in superhero movies. Usually the climax will take place in a well-known area so people can watch and be like, wow, I was right there to think I was that close to Dr. Octopus. That's so crazy. It's nice having some sort of real life relations to a comic book story because they're pretty far fetched so the second you throw in some common name or common place you can't help but attach yourself to the storyline more so. But what if the climax happened and then all of a sudden Pizza Hut. Yeah, you heard me. So back in 1993, before I even existed, there was an X-Men issue, rather there were four issues, that were part of this X-Men Collector's Edition comics, with the fourth issue saying right on the cover, explosive finale brought to you by Pizza Hut. Yeah, so they sold these comics back then in Pizza Huts, about Cyclops and Bishop, when the climax is them going into a computer, and it's pretty wacky. They're like, whoa, all the cyberspace is warping around us. The visuals are all retro, green and yellow. Then this giant face appears and it's none other than Arcade. He compromised Cerebro's core, or did he? <laughs> so the fact that this is like a Pizza Hut comic series is hilarious because it's a good story But then Pizza Hut's like hey, don't forget about us Like you could straight up go in order a pizza grab a comic book and then pay at the counter That would be the best day ever hands down the end of the series was a little odd However, see it was all Professor X and he was testing the X-Men and he finishes the fourth and final issue With a little monologue about how he could always rely on a few good mutants to get the job done And then Jubilee's like yeah for sure Anyways, anyone wants some pizza? And then, yeah, it's a pretty, it's an advertisement. It's just like, hey, check this out. 
Psych, medium pepperoni, debit. Number eight, Star Trek slash X-Men. As weird as this one sounds, it actually made more sense than some other straight up X-Men stories. This crossover comic titled Just Star Trek slash X-Men saw our favorite mutants teaming up with the original series crew of the Starship Enterprise. The worlds collided due to a rift in space through which Proteus was able to move through and take hold of the long dead crewmate Gary Mitchell. In this issue, we get to see some pretty great shared moments between the two teams. Both Bones and Beast respond when Dr. McCoy is called upon and Wolverine gets knocked out by Spock's Vulcan nerve pinch. Marvel character Gladiator is also featured in the issue and even punches Captain Kirk's ship full on, much to his surprise. And number seven, young dragons in love. Love is a beautiful thing. It comes in all shapes and sizes, even that of, well, a dragon. We go now to X-Men issue 181 titled Young Dragons in Love. This 1984 comic opens with quite possibly the two best images ever. The first opening shot is a group of bystanders looking up, being like, look up in the sky. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? Is it a, and then one guy's like, it's a dragon. And then in the next picture, the dragon is so stupidly large. Like it's way above them. It's, they're right directly underneath it. You would see this dragon from miles away. Like they're all just staring, trying to figure it out. Hey, if you thought that was a plane, you might need some glasses. I don't know, just an idea. This issue is quite fun. It shows the group of people flipping through the book, trying to figure out if it's the Hulk or whoever. Then they're like, man, everybody at school will be so jealous we discovered a new monster. Sure. So out of this dragon falls the X-Men and they start losing their shit. They're like asking for autographs, they're talking about Storm's hair change, thinking if it's like good or not. They probably worked for TMZ now that I think about it. The comic is just them trying to fight this dragon and also a smaller dragon that makes noises that like contribute to the conversation. Like someone will say something and then the little dragon will be like sigh after a line, but it's all smoky and dragon-like, it's amazing. And when it comes to Marvel and dragons, after Ragnarok, I think we can pull this one off on the big screen. I'll paint myself green, I'll send in a self-tape. I'll be the dragon, done and done, let's do it. Number six, performance. This story comes to us from Uncanny X-Men Annual Issue Number 10, where we are first introduced to Longshot, who of course comes from the Mojoverse. During this issue, while Longshot also shows up, so does a bunch of Mojo's goo. Yep. Mojo's goo. And the panels we get involving this evil plot and the goo are, well, there's something. Mojo's plan is to capture the X-Men and bring them to Mojo World to have them perform live. So he sends Longshot and the aforementioned goo, which depowers the mutants and also turns them into children. In the end, it's up to the new mutants to save the transformed core X-Men of the day, which also happen to include Magneto. Number five, Mojo's Media Madness. Remember that low budget indie film that came out in like 1939? It was called The Wizard of Oz, I think it was like Oz had this younger singer Judy Garland Garfield something like that I don't know not really well known only a handful of people have seen it I guess I don't know this next X-Men issue takes the question we never knew we needed an answer to that question being what if the X-Men were in the Wizard of Oz yeah so that villain Mojo is known for using Earth as forms of television entertainment for the universe. So in 1992, the issue titled Mojo's Media Madness had this epically weird storyline where Mojo gets Rogue, Cyclops, Beast, and Wolverine to think that they are characters from The Wizard of Oz. So Wolverine is talking like a cowardly lion and it's actually quite hilarious. I feel like this type of story is what WandaVision is gonna end up feeling like on Disney+. Plus. Just a lot of weird references and lines opposite of how the character normally is. So if you wanna see for yourself, make sure you check out X-Men issue 10 from 1997. Number Number four, something slimy this way comes. This is a bizarre story where Professor X decided to throw a surprise birthday party for Kitty Pry and hired the most inappropriate clown, Obnoxio, for the party. In this first panel, we see Obnoxio smoking a cigar and thinking about how he's going to spend the pile of money that the professor promised him. The even weirder part of this story is that while this crazy party is going down with this ridiculous clown, the X Mansion is infiltrated by a villainous mutant who can turn himself into ice cream, appropriately named Ice Cream, but spelt like an eyeball and the shrieking sound that is referred to as a scream. What's more is no one seems to know that Obnoxio was coming. I guess it's a super secret surprise? And Obnoxio also ends up in a ridiculous fight with the X-Men. Not only that, he actually doesn't do too bad. And number three. X babies Mojo has popped up a few times on this list now and for good reason. We've seen Super Babies before, whether it's in Amazon Prime's The Boys or Baby Grinch. Yeah, that part always hurt my teeth. I can't watch that. I get flashbacks from when I broke my front teeth. No, thank you. But we also have X-Babies. That's right, so Mojo went ahead and did the X-Men dirty. So in the X-Men Annual Issue 10, Mojo is inspired by Muppet Babies and thinks, you know what would be pretty cool? X-Men Babies. 
and it was pretty cool. This issue was released in 1986 and was the issue that introduced Longshot, actually. I like Baby Wolverine. He still rocks the claws and he's a badass, but he's like a cute badass. He has the hair. It's amazing. If I have a kid, I'm going to dress him up like Wolverine and hopefully he doesn't talk the same. I don't know. They say golly gumbucks in the issue quite a bit and now I'm going to start saying golly gumbucks all the time. If you could see any X-Men as a baby in live action, which one would you pick? Comment down below so we can chat about it next video. Number two, Professor X gets sent weird honeymoon pictures. This is more of a moment that happened in the story, Hell Hath No Fury, as opposed to the whole story itself being weird. But the moment is so weird, it just needs to be touched on. At the beginning of the comic, we see Professor X reminiscing on the first of his students and also the first to join his X-Men team, pupil Scott Summers. Cyclops has recently left the team to settle down with his now new wife, Madeline Pryor, who looks exactly like Jean Grey. Scott had considered that she might actually be the reincarnation of Jean, but we later find out that she was actually Jean's clone created by Mr. Sinister. Professor X is reading a letter he's received from Scott detailing the events of his newlywed life and includes a picture of Scott and Maddie in bed together. Not only is that a weird thing to send your teacher slash father figure, but it's also weird in the sense that it makes you wonder who was taking this picture. Scott and Maddie also appear to possibly be both naked while in bed as well, so there's that. And finally number one. Dracula? This time of the year is my favorite. The smell of leaves, decaying, lots of chocolate, and people that look like Dracula. I don't know, sign me up. Halloween always slaps. Now I figured it was only fitting to end this wacky list with Dracula himself making an appearance in the X-Men universe. We go now to X-Men Apocalypse vs. Dracula, which made its debut back in 2006. The series is quite cool, but of course it takes place in 1459, so right off the bat, pun intended, you're drawn into this medieval artwork and you see Vlad the Impaler just murking people, like left and right. It's kind of like the Battle of the Bastards episode from Game of Thrones. Just a lot of metal clashing. Any movie with metal clashing, I'm in, sign me up. I love this kind of theme, the dark and spooky, like let's go. With Mahershala Ali signed on to play Blade in the MCU, I don't think we're that far out from seeing Dracula fight some Avengers. Jared Leto and Morbius as well, I think we got some bloodsuckers in the pipeline. Number 10, Infinity. Well, Infinity is a story that is much bigger than Thor himself, his role in this story was pretty dark. He was forced to destroy a builder, blowing a clean hole through this alien creature. Thor was sent as Earth's emissary to negotiate their surrender and bow down to the will of the builders. But in reality, the Avengers had a trick up their sleeve and double-crossed the alien race who threatened the existence of the Earth and many other planets. Thor summoned his hammer Mjolnir from far away, smashing a hole clean through the builder's chest and proving just how terrifying of a foe he can be when needed. And how when when needed, Thor will not hesitate to kill his opponents, like some other heroes might. After smashing a hole through the builder's chest, he finished them off with a hammer to the head. Splat. Number 9. If he be worthy. Dark stories usually come out of times when Thor is no longer worthy, and this is also one of those times. This story kicked off the 2014 run of Thor, where Thor lost his arm in a fight with Malekith. We were also first introduced to the initially mysterious Lady Thor in this issue, who was deemed worthy when it came to wielding Mjolnir and retrieving it from the moon, where it remained when no other Asgard Guardians seemed able to lift it. Thor's loss of his arm would lead to him being very depressed for quite a while and would in this case add injury to insult as he was already reeling emotionally from being unable to retrieve Mjolnir. Although he would eventually get a sweet black Uru arm crafted because Odin refused to accept an armless son. Kinda rude. And likely added more stress to Thor to hear his dad say that. Sounds like I'm not gonna have a son that's useless. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Just because he lost an arm he's useless? Rude. Number 8. Sundown. This story is both beautiful beautiful and dark, heart-wrenching and bright all at once. It's tragic. And hey, just because the story is dark doesn't mean it can't feature electric and bright colors, which of course in this issue comes from the amazing Matthew Wilson. Sheesh, I love this guy's colors. They're always so beautiful. In issue 705 of Mighty Thor, we watch a super sick Jane Foster as Lady Thor take on Mangog and pretty much kill herself during the fight. In the end, she is forced to sacrifice Mjolnir in order to defeat Mangog, launching the villain and her hammer into the sun. Due to the fact that Jane was battling cancer at the time, every time she changed into Thor due to that whole process, the progress of her chemo basically gets erased. And when she removes her helmet and changes back this time, she knows it will be her last. Her and Thor share one last kiss as she changes 
changes back from Thor to a very sickly and cancer ridden Jane Foster, and she appears to die. Some truly bleak and beautiful writing here from Jason Aaron. Number 7, Midgard's Final Doom. In 2018's Thor, we get a flip back and forth between a younger Thor and an older future Thor, King of Asgard, but also the last Asgardian left. No matter what this version of Thor does as well, it seems there is nothing he can do to prevent the Earth from dying. But that doesn't mean he's not going to stop trying. In issue number 6, his main threat is a future Doom who is also Sorcerer Supreme in this future timeline. King Thor is joined by his old pal, Phoenix Force Wolverine, who ends up sacrificing his life imbuing Mjolnir with the Phoenix Force in order to help King Thor defeat Doom and save the world. Well, try to save the world. As beautiful as the art is, the story itself is pretty grim. Grim, but spectacular. Number 6, Thor First Thunder. Near the end of this story, Thor gives into warrior madness and we see just how destructive Thor can be when his rage is left unchecked. He wreaks havoc on Manhattan, nearly killing Spider-Man and the Fantastic Four, as well as Jane Foster, while working in tandem alongside his brother Loki. In the end, he regains his senses, but for a while there, it was looking like Thor would have destroyed it all, burned it all, and blown it all down with his mighty power. You do not want to mess with an angry Thor, I'll tell you that much. Number 5, Thor Thor vs. The Mysterious Radioactive Man This was a story about Thor that actually appeared in the original Journey Into Mystery series. Yeah, not all dark stories need to come from present day comics by the way. In fact, without likely realizing it at the time, some of the darkest moments in comics history have actually come to us from incredulously outdated moments way back in the past. Journey Into Mystery gives us one such story and moment. In this comic, we see Thor attempt to take on villain Radioactive Man. In this issue, we find out Radioactive Man's backstory as a nuclear physicist from China who gained radioactive powers. He was then sent on a mission to New York to challenge and defeat Thor. The ending of the story is what is the dark part though. When Thor attempted to send Radioactive Man back to China in a tornado, which Radioactive Man explained would cause him to reach critical mass before he touched down, Thor showed no regard for the innocent lives that could be affected and destroyed by basically the nuclear bomb that Radioactive Man would become on impact. As far as he was concerned, that was Radioactive Man and China's problem, not his. Wow. And he says that in the comic too. Yikes. Number 4, Ragnarok. Or at least one of. This Ragnarok story took place in 1998's Thor, starting in issue 80. It was part of the Avengers Disassembled event. Here we basically saw Thor take on a resurrected Surtur, who was brought back by Loki. Loki, 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 what did you do? Surtur and his army took on the gods, defeating them one by one. Thor learned, however, that this was all part of a cycle and that the gods were destined to fail and be reborn, giving energy to those who sit above in shadow. In other words, the gods of the gods. The story ends with Thor disrupting this resurrection cycle by basically destroying a tapestry, but at the supposed cost of his life and the lives of his people. At the end of the series, he is believed dead by his fellow comrades and heroes, though in reality, he wasn't quite dead yet, but instead was revealed to be in a slumber-like stasis, resting before returning. Number 3, The Devourer King This is the first arc in Donny Cates' Thor run, which just started earlier this year in January of 2020. The series started off with completely giving him a new dark look and dark and immensely powerful villain to go along with this look, who we'd see fully revealed at the end of issue number 4, The Black Winter, also known as the Star Plague. The Black Winter is the cosmic force that was known for wiping out the entire universe prior to the one that we have now, way back when, when Galen became Galactus. In fact, Thor is even forced to team up with Galactus in order to take on the Black Winter, and the frightening thing is by comparison, both of these characters appear small, standing next to the celestial shadow of a monster that is the Black Winter. And also, Thor is pretty OP at this point, so that's, that's something. Something. Number 2, The God Butcher. The whole universe wasn't threatened by this villain in Jason Aaron's run, but all of the gods certainly were. And I mean, all of the gods. In the story arc known as The God Butcher, we were introduced to Gore, a fearsome and well written villain. Gore learns of the gods and basically blames them for everyone's suffering, and so sets out on a mission to kill them armed with the Necrosword, also known as the All Black, which we later discover via Donny Cates also happened to be the first symbiote. It's all connected. Ooh. Which I love. Gore at one point also threatened all of the gods' existence with his own god bomb as well, which would kill all gods across all timelines and realities. A pretty scary reality for someone like Thor. Number one, the mighty Thor, Lord of Asgard. Or I guess you could just call it Lord of Asgard. I think we all know what we're talking about when we say that. This story quickly becomes quite dark. Thor ends up taking over for Odin as king of Asgard after his father is killed in a battle by Surtur. In this story, we saw Thor not only command Asgard, but also decide to conquer and rule over Midgard, aka 
aka Earth. Those who oppose his rule are severely punished, locked away or killed, and Thor basically becomes a tyrant. He also marries Enchantress and has a son with her. Eventually he realizes how awful his actions have been and how wrong he was when his son Magni, who has fallen in love with a human woman, confronts him. In the end, Thor decides the best course of action is to change the timeline so that none of this ever happened, erasing this bleak story and therefore causing it to be considered an alternate timeline in retrospect. Number 10, Superman vs. Muhammad Ali. Yeah, you heard me. This one shot made its debut back in 1978, written by Dennis O'Neill and Neil Adams. It featured the Man of Steel and of course, Muhammad Ali. So how is this a thing? Well, it was part of the all new collector's edition, numbered C56. So basically, this alien named Ratlar, who is part of a species known as the Scrub, visits Earth, and they demand that they pick their best fighter to go against theirs. There's being a behemoth named Hanya. If they refuse, well, the Scrub will then destroy the planet. So Muhammad Ali argues that since Superman isn't technically from Earth, he must be the one who fights. Ratlar is amused by this, as he wants to know who's better of the two. So he pins the two champs up against each other. Now, of course, you're thinking, dude, Superman would dust him, hands down, no competition at all. Well, the fight is set to take place on Bodace, which is orbiting a red star. So, no powers for soups. So, Muhammad Ali trains Superman to become a boxer. So, they start training in Superman's Fortress of Solitude. Might as well train without powers, right? Get used to it? Well, the unlikely duo are given 24 hours to train, but using a time warping device, they're able to train for a couple months. Ratlar figures out the device is being used, and boom, training's over boys, wrap it up, nice try. So the fight is broadcasted intergalactically, thousands tune in. Superman puts up a good fight, but ultimately Muhammad Ali is the greatest boxer ever to live, so Supes goes down. So now, Muhammad Ali has to fight Hanya even predicting which round he'll go down by. Four, he says it's four. Now, of course, Muhammad Ali doesn't hold up too well against an alien at first, but he eventually knocks him out of the ring in the fourth round. Whew. See ya, dude. Number nine, Rainbow Hands. Yep, I said Rainbow Hands. Making its debut in 1958, the issue titled Superman's New Power, this might be even weirder than the Muhammad Ali one. So after detecting a disturbance under Metropolis, Superman checks it out, only to discover it's indeed an alien ship. So as soon as Clarky comes in contact with the ship, it explodes. Later on, he goes to fight some crooks, because you know how he does it. When he goes to use his powers, they're actually a bit different now. They're actually rainbow beams. Yeah, he shoots rainbows out of his fingers. How magical. This causes all of the crooks to become non-aggressive. And if that wasn't weird enough, soon after he discovers that he can shoot mini clones of himself at people. The people of Metropolis love this. I mean, of course they do. They get so attached to the clones that even Superman himself is like, hey guys, what about what about me though? <clears throat> Great, come on, I shot the shot the clones. I'm the guy. Number eight, the s Snare. This issue was released with Action Comics Volume 1, issue number 592, back in 1987. The cover of this issue, first of all, is enough to draw you in. I mean, it shows Superman with Big Barda, like they're making out. And who's in the background? Mr. Miracle. Just watching the whole thing in horror. He even says the line, Superman and my wife? and it's laid across the cover. So what's going on? Mr. Miracle goes home to find Darkseid sitting on his couch. Immediately asking where Bart is, Darkseid gives him a tape to play, which may be the scariest moment of his life. I mean, if Darkseid just handed me a tape, I'd be like, no, what did you do? No, what is, no, I have to rewind it first. So he clicks play and sees Big Barda dancing for sleeves. They don't show it, but it's, it's, it's heavily implied that it's in nature. So Sleaze takes mind-controlled Barda and Superman to an adult film director. Yep, and his name is even Grossman. His idea is that the adult tape would make enough money to accumulate an army to go against Darkseid. I mean, you know, that or a charity. Sure. And then in comes Mr. Miracle to save the day, releasing the two from Sleaze's mind control. That would have been a real awkward brunch if Mr. Miracle didn't show up. Quite the miracle if you ask me. Number seven, Super Menace. Coming from Superman Volume 1, Issue 137, titled The Super Brat from Krypton. This one's fun and, of course, super weird. So Superman has a twin, or clone, rather. That's right, so when Jor-El shot Kal-El into space after the destruction of Krypton, that ship ended up crashing into a derelict space satellite and was then ooh, duplicated. The ship and the super baby inside of it. Now there's two of each. Now, of course, we know what happens to Superman's ship, but what about the other one? <laughs> that craft was found by criminals named Derek and Bonnie. So they see this as a golden opportunity to raise a supervillain. Not a bad idea, honestly. I mean, it's pretty 
All right, cool. So they have this little super bat and they tell him not to be seen until the right time because that would be pretty bait, you know? So a kryptonite meteor crashes and they realize that it doesn't affect little super bad. Oh So years go by and the super bad baby named himself Super Menace. That name does sound cool. All right, it's cooler than what I was saying. And it's finally time to make his debut and go against Superman. So they fight and Superman used his x-ray vision to see that this clone has something off about him. Superman is pissed now because Superman's like, yo, you don't even have a normal body? What's going on with you? And then Super Menace makes it rain kryptonite meteors. This almost kills Superman until Super Menace decided he doesn't want to be a Super Menace anymore. So he saves Superman and goes back home. And that's when he turns his body back into raw energy, destroying him and his not so nice adoptive parents in the process. Number six, Red and Blue 162. That's right, Superman Volume 1, Issue 162, titled The Amazing Story of Superman Red and Superman Blue. It's an all imaginary issue. So that's cool, I think. We just talked about Superman's evil clone. Well, that's not the first time they've had the idea of another Superman. So the Kandorians aren't too happy with Superman at this point. He was supposed to enlarge Kandor, cure kryptonite, and stop all the crimes ever on Earth. And he couldn't do it. Wow, what a loser, dude. You're fired, Superman. That's really, you can't do all those things? Embarrassing, if you ask me. So he splits himself up into two identical beings, which you guessed it, are Superman Red and Superman Blue. And they both crush it. They recreate Brainiac's enlarging ray. They bring Kandor back to its original size on an all new Krypton. Step two, get rid of all the evil. Easy peasy. The Red and Blue Super 2 create an anti-evil ray, fancy, and ends all crimes on Earth. Superman Red marries Lois Lane and Superman Blue marries Lana Lang and they all live happily ever after, even Lex Luthor. Number five, ants. 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 Ant -Man. That's right, we got ants. Coming at you from Action Comics Volume 1, Issue 296, The Invasion of Ants and it sounds just as crazy as you would guess. The cover alone is super weird and almost inviting. It shows Superman on the side of a building with an ant mask on. He's even saying the words, follow me ant soldiers, buzz, 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 buzz. we must capture Lois Lane, buzz, 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 buzz. she will be our queen. Okay, you got it. So after a colony of giant ants was mutated from a nuclear war on another planet, they decided to come and check out Earth, as they all do, because we're so cool and all. So Superman uses red kryptonite radiation to give himself an ant's head, not a mask. See, I said mask earlier, I was throwing you off. It's a head, he's got an ant's head. And he communicates with them. This is like the ultimate amalgam character. Clark Pym, anybody? I'd pay to see that. Number four. Run! It's Godzilla! Yep, we even got Flaming Dragons. Superman Volume 1, Issue 142, appropriately titled Flame Dragon from Krypton. So Clark Kent and Lois Lane are heading to the Metropolis Space Exploration Convention Center because somebody apparently captured a space beast. Yeah, okay. So they arrive and yeah, there's, there's straight up a space beast. Supes knows what it is. It's actually called the Kryptonian Flame Beast. I could have guessed that one, I mean, come on. So it sprays fire all over Clark and all that is left is still Clark, but his regular clothes have been burned away. So he starts fighting the beast as Superman. And then the Flame Beast swallows a red kryptonite meteor. So Superman keeps his distance. He knows what's going on. He's dodging hits. He's waiting until the red kryptonite's effects starts taking action. And it weakens the beast, so Superman splashes it with water, freezes it with his icy dentine ice breath, and he hoofs it out to space. Then when Lois returns to the scene, she sees Clark all bandaged up, and the doctors are like, oh, he has minor burns, and she buys it, of course. The doctor is being Batman and Supergirl in disguise. Number three, Red Kryptonite. Action Comics Volume 1, Issue 283 has a plot that I would pay millions of dollars to see on the big screen. It would be so weird to see this. Titled The Red Kryptonite Menace, we find Jan Dex and Zogar, two chameleon criminal men from the future. So they travel back in time and they set up camp on a hidden island in Metropolis Bay. Their goal is to attract red and green kryptonite from space. So of course the military is onto them, but they disguise themselves. How you ask? Oh, as a pile of rocks and a tree. And it works because that's, that's how easy it is. They set a trap with red kryptonite and plan to get Superman to go near it. The plan works like a charm and upon Superman's arrival, his health starts to decline. So he wishes for thick fog and it comes true. Okay, so what's next? Superman can grant himself wishes now? How, what, how is this possible? Okay, so then he wishes for, you guessed it, Sherlock Holmes to come and help him. <sighs> 
This red kryptonite allows for him to wish for Sherlock Holmes. Benedict or Robert, which one did you go with? We're curious. Number two, the Bat Witch. And no, I don't mean a sandwich made of bats, cause that would be disgusting. And this channel, we don't show anything disgusting here. Batman getting his hands and head cut off though? That's more like it. That's now we're talking. Released in 1969, issue 186 of The World's Finest, we find Batman in quite the pickle, to say the least. So Superman and Batman have actually traveled back in time to solve a mystery of a broken bust that resembled Batman. So they go back in time and they rescue a lady named Sylvia Ward. Now Sylvia was actually accused of witchcraft. So Superman helps her stay afloat and Batman swims with her back to shore. And then she thanks Batman by kissing him right in the lips. Then Superman goes to introduce himself and Batman's like, nah, I got this, and takes her to the local bar. Oops. So Superman decides to use this era in his favor. He dressed up as Batman and starts doing like crazy witchcraft stuff. So much so the town deems him an actual witch. So he's about to be burned at the stake and then a thunderstorm rolls in. And everyone's like, ah, I love watching people burn but can't stand the rain, we're out of here. Everybody leaves except for, you guessed it, Ben Franklin. Sorry, what? Yeah, Ben, ben Franklin, like the Ben Franklin. He's just hanging out there apparently. He actually tries to free Batman with one of his experiments but Superman doesn't let that happen. Eventually, even Ben Franklin's like, all right, man, you're on your own, see ya, dude. And when Batman asks Superman why he's doing this, Superman says, figure it out yourself. So next time you catch your friend maybe flirting with your crush, just frame them for witchcraft. It works every time. And finally, number one, Superman's pal, Jimmy Olsen. Volume one, issue 116, to be exact. Okay, I know I said this list wasn't in a particular order, but I can't not do this one last. This issue came out in 1968, and I don't think we'll ever see it on the big screen, because if we do, I'm going to walk out of said big screen. The cover alone is enough. I mean, it shows Superman flying in, saying, Jimmy, what's gotten into you? Why are you acting like an ape? And then the actual ape on the cover says, because he is an ape, Superman, in my body, I'm the real Jimmy Olsen. Yeah, they switched bodies. I'm surprised that camera didn't explode in Jimmy the Ape's hand. Apes are so strong, it's insane. So after a malfunction of a machine, they switched bodies. So Jimmy Olsen's like body, Jimmy Olsen, starts screaming around like an ape. But Jimmy Olsen, the real person, however, oh, the dude embraces it. He buys a green pinup suit, even a cool hat. He rocks the look. He even goes to work. He's like, ah, oh, you know what? I'm gonna be a simian sensation here at the office. You tell him, Jimmy. 